quantum mechanics, the zero world interpretation. We uh, mentioned Richard Feynman the last two weeks. He said during a discussion of the double slit experiment, I will just take this one experiment which has been designed to contain all the mystery of quantum mechanics to put you up against the paradox and mysteries and peculiarities of nature 100%. He said stuff like that in other places too. Uh, and it is true that the double slit experiment and uh, uh, additions to it uh, really pretty much cover uh, 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 most of what uh, of the difficulties of quantum mechanics. There are a few surprises beyond that, such as the uh, Bose-Einstein constant which uh, in which the uh, uh, various atoms are allowed to be stacked in the same place, which makes no conventional sense. Um, on the other hand, uh, you realize that an atom is 99.9 something percent empty space anyway, so why not? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it's interesting how something that is that much empty space can give you so much trouble when you're stub your foot against it. But <laughs> um, by now most people understand that the double slit experiment can be done with light. That's been around for over 200 years. Um, when it was first done, it was regarded as absolute positive proof that life was composed of waves and not particles, as particles can't produce an interference pattern. There's, if you shoot particles into one or both slits of a, of a double slit experiment, there is no way that you should have any place where if you close off one slit, you get more light to an area than when you open that slit. Uh, but then, light was shown to be produced and absorbed like particles, and all of a sudden we had a problem on our hands. Uh, electrons, which I don't think anybody disputes are particles. Well, I guess maybe now, They're, they are now, but uh, can also exhibit this dual character. and. Uh, we saw last week a, an article showing um, as the slit goes from single to double, an interference pattern coming and then going away as the other slit is the only one that's uh, open. And uh, that's electrons. And it's not just because there's massive numbers of electrons. Well, it is in a way because it's the pattern that they, that they develop, but they do this if they're shot through one at a time. Here's one with two electrons, more electrons, more electrons, more electrons. Finally, you can see very clearly that there's a pattern there. This extends to atoms. And again, we reviewed the evidence last week. It has been extended to buckyballs things made out of 60 carbon atoms. Again, we're talking about, you know, molecules that if you really try hard under an electron microscope, you can actually see these things. And without selecting the velocity very much, you get an interference pattern. If you select the velocity a little more, you get a, quite a bit more of an interference pattern. Just bizarre. And even larger molecules, and again, we looked at that last week, where you have a porphyrin ring, you have four benzene rings stuck to it, and then on the benzene rings are these contraptions that have sulfur and a bunch of carbon and hydrogen, and then a bunch of fluorine as well. Massive 12 or 13 substitutions, in fact, in some cases, 15 substitutions and they go through both slits. That's starting to get uncomfortably large. 
quantum theory has always said that everything is really quantum. It's just that most of the time uh, we mess up the interference. That's actually true. It is difficult to explain all this in traditional physical terms. It is now, in fact, impossible to explain all this in terms of classical particles that have definite properties and do not communicate with each other at speeds equal to or less than the speed of light. If they communicate faster than the speed of light, then the question becomes, which way did the communication go? Because according to relativity, and very few physicists are willing to give that up, in fact, if you are one observer, it will look like the influence went one way. If you're traveling in a different direction fast enough, it will look like the influences went the other way. It's hard to maintain causality when you can't figure out which is cause and which is effect. Um, and then, of course, there's the EPR experiment with modifications, and we're going to see a special modification of that later on. But let me drag you back to the electrons. We're going to send the electrons through two slits. And when we do so, we, can, we will notice that nothing, or perhaps maybe I can say observing, but finding nothing, will collapse the wave function. So imagine a two-way pathway experiment with an electron gun, okay? And when we send it around a central area that, where the electrons are not allowed to go, and then have the two beams come back together, we get a nice little interference pattern, okay? Now what we're going to do is we're going to put a coil around the path where the electron takes. And we'll find, as the electron is shot through the gun, that it puts out a very faint magnetic field, which creates an electric potential in the coil, which if you have a very sensitive uh, voltmeter, ammeter type thing, galvanometer if you like, um, you'll get a little pulse. The electron that you shot out will lose a little bit of its speed, but not a much. And you know, you can compensate for that by just shooting the electron a little faster. Okay? So we can know for a dead certainty not only when or not only that we shot only one electron, but we can know within a reasonable uh, time limit when that electron was shot. Okay, well, you know, if we find out which pathway it goes, the interference is supposed to collapse. Well, that's for light, and light is very light, pardon the expression. And, you know, if we try to measure which way the light went, it will probably run into something. Uh, it, will, it will unavoidably change the light itself, but maybe this electron, we can kind of sneak something in on it. We're going to put a couple of coils around the two areas where uh, it's going to go past, okay? When we do, we lose the interference pattern. Well, we kind of expected that. So the question is, is that because we know, or is that because the, uh, s uh, some influence of the coil? Well, it's the same pathway. Well, I'll tell you what, let's take one of them away. And let's just leave the other one. You can still, uh, you still miss the interference pattern. It's weirder than that. Now we know that the electrons that went this way, we know that they went that way. And we kind of, well, maybe we're just slowing down the electrons too much and they don't, the, 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 when they hit the other side, they don't match or something. 
uh, we, we mess up the pattern. But the weirdest part is that the electrons that passed through this one but did not pass through this one and therefore shouldn't be influenced by the coil, they still don't show an interference pattern. Somehow, something that went the other way told them, oh, you're being watched on the other side not seeing that the electron went one way means that you know it went the other way even if you can't, uh, even if you didn't measure it directly and that messes up the interference pattern. Well, what happens if we turn that detector off? When we do, we get our interference pattern back. Well, maybe, what happens if we put both detectors back? We still have our interference pattern as long as we don't turn either of them on. But if you turn one of them on and it doesn't matter which one, the interference pattern goes away. Not seeing an electron that you were watching for collapses the wave function. There's another interesting uh, wave pattern that they, that they talk about. We'll put a radioactive atom inside a de de detector, okay? And this detector actually will have two parts to it. According to quantum mechanics, if the atom decays, a wave leaves it in all directions. But an alpha particle is found in only one direction. Well, that's not surprising, so the wave Apparently, as soon as it starts being detected, the waveform collapses to an alpha particle that's heading out. The detection of the alpha particle has collapsed the wave into a point. Once you see a trail that starts that says the alpha particle is heading this way, you know for a certainty that it's not heading any other way, even though the quantum mechanical wave that's coming out is spherical. So observing the alpha particle, that is, it, it hits the green detector, collapses the wave into half its radial extent. Actually, if you have a fluorescent light uh, or a fluorescent background or something, you might be able to see that the alpha particle hit, let's say, right over here. In which case, the alpha particle will not be detected anywhere else. The wave collapses before it hits the other screen. It like disappears off of the big screen and not only disappears off the big screen but disappears off of most of the little screen as now, and now is, cl is collapsed onto that point. Einstein really didn't like that because that means that the wave is collapsing faster than the speed of light. You can't do that. Well, apparently you can. But it's worse than that, and that is that not observing the alpha particle on the green detector collapses the wave into precisely half of its original extent. Well, except for the fact that it's expanding, of course, but its radial extent. In other words, you look at it and you don't see it, well, you know it must be down below. The wave function has now lost half of its uh, extent, half of its radial extent, certainly, by simply not seeing it. And that collapse happens faster than the speed of light. Now you have a waveform that goes all the way around here. And yes, there's probably a little bit of diffraction, but you don't have to worry about that. It's minuscule compared to the rest of the wave. And the wave keeps on going until it hits here. And then again, if you have specific detectors, it will collapse to 
the point at which it hits the detector. So this does not make sense. Um, and quantum mechanical people struggle with this a lot. Well, <laughs> so what do you do with that kind of uh, information? Well, you can try to explain it the most traditional way, which is the Copenhagen interpretation. And that says basically the wave is a particle when emitted. Well, we have to accept that. That was the uh, Planck idea that, way, that uh, light was emitted as particles. Certainly electrons are emitted as particles, we would think. They seem to be able to be localized. And then somewhere in transit, nobody knows exactly where or how, it turns into a wave. And then when it's detected, it turns back into a particle. That's odd, but it does seem to explain the data as well as anything, any model around. The wave does not have further meaning. You can't say that the wave is, well, maybe it's a probability wave, but I, I don't know what probability waves really are. Um, and certainly it's not clear how probability waves can interfere with each other. Well, technically it's not a probability wave, okay? It is a wave of uh, the square root of probability. Figure that one out. Um, what, well, you know, the, the quantum, uh, the Copenhagen people just say, well, that's the way it is and you have to deal with it. This requires, of course, the collapse of the wave into a particle, and it collapses at faster than the speed of light, which, again, is really difficult to explain if relativity is true. Well, what causes the collapse? Well, the, the easy way to say is that consciousness causes a collapse. Well, yeah, except for one thing. Uh, much of the measurement that's being made that shows the collapse is not made by conscious people. They, they, they watch it, but it's usually made by computers and detectors and things like that, which most people have always assumed is not, are not conscious. Well, maybe it's measurement. Um, well, what about reversible measurement? It turns out that you don't have to, uh, uh, measurement won't collapse the waveform unless it's irreversible. Um, well, is a four-year-old good enough for collapse to occur? Do you have to be a nuclear physicist? Do you have to be a normal person, uh, an adult? What if you're retarded? What about a cat? Remember the Schrodinger's cat? Who's alive and dead at the same time? Well, but if the cat's observing, doesn't that collapse it? One of the weirder aspects of it, as I was reading, I found out that uh, there are two things. One of them is that if you watch the, uh, you watch the radioactive ad atom all the time, it, um, it has less of a chance of decaying. So if the cat, I guess, is curious and smart enough, why, uh, then maybe it will be saved, as, as opposed to curiosity killing the cat. But, uh, or maybe a cat's not good enough. You have to have human observers. You know, it, it raises all kinds of interesting questions. Can you imagine physicists trying to get various people and animals and stuff to observe a, uh, an experiment to see where it becomes reversible? 
it's an interesting question. I don't know how you get funding for that experiment, but uh, what about a computer? Well, is that good enough? In some instances, it appears to be at least temporarily good enough, but if you erase the memory on the computer, does it go back to interference? Those are difficult questions, and uh, for that reason, the Copenhagen exper uh, a way of explaining things has, uh, I wouldn't say fallen on hard times, is still the plurality explanation among physicists, about 40, 42% more or less, of physicists believe in the Copenhagen explanation. But it's not as universal as or near universal as it once was. Um, there's the Bohm interpretation, which is the pilot waves guide an actual particle. The particle goes through one slit or the other. But the wave goes through both and somehow the wave is able to tell whether you're, when you're looking at it. You know, the, the cerebral cortex on those waves is just striking. Uh, um, so we have particles guided by waves. In fact, if you set up the math properly, you can make it almost completely fit. There was a time when people thought it, it did completely fit. And there are some new fluid dynamics experiments which suggest a possible mechanism. They have been able to create um, uh, particles that bounce up and down and, and create their own waves. And they go through once, the particle goes through one slit, the wave detects that both slits are open and so forth. Although how the wave is going to detect that there's a detector that's been turned off and so we can go ahead and, uh, and uh, cause interference is beyond me. You know, the switch is far enough away that it really shouldn't matter. But anyway, it, that doesn't require large molecules to split up so you can have the buckyball go through one slit and its ghost image go, or ghost uh, wave goes through the other slit and interferes and causes it to pile up in the ways you've seen. Um, it does require faster than light communication. They did the math on that and yes, you're stuck with that whether you like it or not. Uh, and that means that something that's, that defies relativity is going on here. And you'll hear every once in a while the quantum mechanics and relativity are not consistent with each other and yet they're the two best theories in physics. Go figure. Well, that of course means that we're non-local. And there's a paper just out now showing that actually it doesn't quite match quantum theory. Um, I haven't seen, I, I think the paper's been quoted in two other papers, um, and it was kind of a, as an aside without, uh, without a critical evaluation of the paper. So I don't know whether the paper is really as good as it sounds, but it looks like the Bohm theory actually doesn't match quantum mechanics after all. In which case, I think most physicists are going to bet on quantum mechanics and not on the Bohm theory. But then, of course, you can say, well, the waveform never really does collapse. What happens is that the electron goes into one, uh, one world that completely splits the entire universe over the action of this electron and the other world goes the other way, and both happen. It's just that we get split into one, or yeah, we get split into one or the other, and then our doppelganger goes into the other, the other one, which raises interesting questions about the best of all possible worlds and Dr. Pangloss and so forth. Um, um, when a quantum event occurs, the universe sim completely splits into two more universes over this one electron or photon, and one in which the quantum went one way and the other in which quantum went the other way. 
Well, actually, it's more complicated than that. What happens if the quantum is heading towards a TV screen and the wave could hit anywhere on the screen? Now, with one electron, you split the world into millions of worlds, literally. Uh, now, I do have to say that for the people who evaluate these things, say that it's perfectly consistent with the mathematics, although maybe we'll find a change. It does raise some interesting questions about conservation of mass and energy, and it does raise interesting questions about um, uh, you know, making millions of worlds, well, gazillions of worlds, that we cannot see or ever experience just to satisfy a wave function going to a, uh, a TV screen does seem a little in excessive. Um, now, if you want multiple universes, this is one way to get them. And maybe in one of those universes, uh, way back when, uh, life somehow got started in spite of the incredible odds against it. But this does lead to an incredible number of universes for what seem to be trivial reasons. Uh, just because we can't predict where the electron is going to land, it's not clear why an electron heading toward a TV screen can split in, uh, the world into gazillions of worlds, whereas other contingent events, such as which way a rock is going to fall, well, of course, those are deterministic, so you don't actually have to split the universe for that. Although, maybe the rock happens to have some quantum mechanical interactions with the, uh, with the uh, slope that it's falling down, in which case each one of those will split the world into millions of universes as well. Um, it's just kind of weird to me. Human choices, which appear to be partly free, um, can't split the world into multiple Maybe they do. Maybe we are quantum computers. Uh, and there's a world in which Hitler decided he really didn't think the Jews were that bad. Why couldn't we have gone to that world? Um, perhaps the most damaging criticism uh, from my perspective of that theory is that the theory fails to explain the very thing it is created for. That is to say, what I want to know is why the electron went here instead of here or here or here. And it has nothing to say about which way we actually go because when we experience quantum mechanics, in fact, it does go here and not here or here, right? Well, sometimes it goes up there. But in any individual case, we can all sit there and watch the screen and say, yep, that was the left lower quadrant, right? Why did we go one way instead of us not going all ways? So it doesn't actually answer the question that it was intended to answer. Now, there are people who will say statistically or in ensemble interpretation that quantum mechanics doesn't predict specifics, it just predicts the generalities. Uh, what we have a, a, is a description of how multiple quantum objects behave on the average. And sometimes these people will say, you know, all you have is the measurements. And as David Merman is quoted as saying, and some people thought it was Richard Feynman, but apparently not, uh, shut up and calculate. It works, don't ask questions. Well, that's not terribly satisfying either. Um, the, the other thing is that the individual quantum objects, for example, the electron that's being shot towards uh, the double slit and then beyond, appears to obey the rules for multiple quantum objects. It's true, he could hit anywhere on the screen, but there are areas where it's much more likely to hit and areas where it's much less likely to hit. And uh, 
the ensemble interpretation really doesn't help us out with much with that until you pull this wave back in. And once you pull the wave back in, then you have to ask, well, when did it stop being a wave and start being a particle? So you're right back to the same problem that makes the Copenhagen interpretation difficult. Well, some people will question that maybe our rules of logic aren't fair. That we need something called quantum logic. It's, it's kind of hard to swallow the idea that we should abandon logic because of this. And it raises the question of what kind of logic are you going to put in its place that's going to actually work. Um, but desperate times require desperate measures. Uh, then there's the time symmetric interpretation, which basically says that uh, Maxwell's equation can be run backwards as well as forwards. And uh, so what's really happening is that the quantum is going both into the future, which is the way we'd expect, and into the past. And the one that's going into the past makes sure that everything works out according to quantum rules. Uh, and sort of playing with time a little bit. Now that's really kind of hard to swallow, but um, I do have to say that quantum eraser experiments kind of encourage us to at least consider that possibility. Um, but that means that time doesn't operate for somebody the way it does for us or for something. And it's either the quantum objects that have incredibly large cranial capacity or there's somebody out there who understands quantum mechanics and who is basically omnipotent, omnipresent, and makes things come out right. Now, then there's the zero worlds interpretation. And that is that this whole thing is a setup. The proposal has been made that the material world is in an important sense not real and consistent. Not real meaning it doesn't stay the same when you're not looking at it as it does when you are. Uh, and again, we've seen passive observation without any interference whatsoever is enough to mess the system up. Now, of course, our observations are consistent and reliable in this view, but they're grounded in consciousness and in particular in common consciousness that is to say when we discuss with each other oh something is green because we can see it green well yeah it looks green to me too Though that's not because it's really green it's because our quantum consciousness have congealed around that idea it's not a totally objective world now, it's really difficult to separate this kind of argument from the idea that we're in a simulation. And there may not be much uh, difference, and uh, we're going to come back to that in a little bit. But first, I want to introduce to you what was called tongue-in-cheek, the einstein podolsky rosen garrett um, experiment. And uh, this one, I don't know the answer to. But something is going to happen rapidly that, uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense, OK? <coughs> <coughs> now, the einstein podolsky rosen experiment sent, things t uh, sent uh, photons that were entangled in opposite directions. And then there was some kind of a splitter, which allowed vertically polarized light to go one way and horizontally polarized light to go the other way. Uh, so we're going to put a calcite crystal in so that the, uh, the polarizations are split. And you can put detectors here and detectors there and detectors here and here. And that's the traditional einstein podolsky rosen experiment. And one of the things we discovered is when you turn one, the other side knows that you turned it so much, and so the correlations are maintained, which requires, this is one of the experiments which required 
uh, communication faster than light. Okay, but what we're going to do is something a little different. We're going to send them on uh, to some kind of a combiner. I don't know whether it would be another calcite crystal or line just right, or whether it would be a set of half silvered mirrors and we have to do some fancy stuff with the, uh, uh, with the polarization in order to make it line up. But somehow I'm sure we can get this thing to join. And when we do, all of the photons will go up or perhaps with a slight adjustment, all of the photons will go straight. And so we now have a coherent, uh, we have a quantum um, mechanical arrangement, okay, that, that, uh, w that gives us interference. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is we're going to take a detector and move it into here, maybe another one and put it in there. And now, we can tell which way the wet light went. But over on this side, the interference should collapse because we now know which way the light went, right? Well, what that means is that if you shine a lot of light, and we can do this, you know, multiple times, and it will always work the same way, if, if we have detectors on this side, then the interference pattern will disappear. And then when we remove the detectors, the interference pattern will reappear, and now by moving the detectors in and out, we can send Morse code. So not only is there communication between the photons faster than light, but we can actually communicate ourselves faster than light. And then the other guy on the other side can uh, take his little detectors and put them in the way and uh, send Morse code back to us. And because uh, the, the effect works regardless of how many photons are going in, we could actually make it strong enough that we could see the light flickering back and on. Da, 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 da. And we could communicate faster than light. If the Copenhagen in interpretation were actually correct, one might expect that. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Well, <coughs> my take on this Entanglement is mathematically equivalent to measurement. This is interesting because um, they, have, they have exactly the same form in the, uh, in the quantum formalization. You can't tell the difference between them mathematically. And that means that what's really happening is when you're measuring something, you're entangling it with your uh, measuring apparatus and finally with you. Maybe they are fundamentally the same process. And the reason we have these paradoxes is that we're trying to ignore the observer. And scientists have always been, you know, kind of, well, we're observing and we're not really changing anything. Well, maybe once we start measuring quantum objects, we get entangled. And the measurement is going to be influenced by that entanglement. What we're actually observing in fact, in one way of looking at it is information. And interestingly, information comes in bits, which is why quantum phenomena look like they come in bits, and which is why that wave equation doesn't allow you to make it completely smooth wave with no, uh, because there's only, a, there, there's a certain minimum below which you can't go, and Planck's constant, constant tells you. There is, I have to say, with this view, it's, you know, the real world isn't real, so to speak. There is no defense against the idea that we're in a simulation. We could be. Well, but it feels real. Wait a minute. If you have a really good simulation on a computer, ask yourself if you don't get immersed in that process. If somebody writes a good novel, sometimes you'll get immersed in that process. But a, but a, a 
computer simulation that takes your entire visual field, you'll feel like you're in it. And you will start operating like you're in it. And you will start operating by the rules of whoever made that computer simulation. So it feels real is not a defense, especially if it's maybe the best computer programmer that ever lived. Quantum theory, in fact, allows us to have perfectly correlated observations that are grounded not in an objective physical reality, there's something out there, but in shared subjective experience, perhaps guided by an uber intelligence. Again, we may argue that it feels so real, but we know from quantum experiments that light, electrons, atoms, buckyballs, and other even larger molecules are not real in the classical sense. They don't exist in one position in one place. They go through two slits at the same time. Let me repeat that. Light, electrons, atoms, buckyballs, and other even larger molecules are not real in the classical sense. That means literally, think about this, everything you see, because that involves light, everything you smell, because that involves molecules, everything you touch, because that involves molecules, everything you hear, because that involves movement of molecules, and Everything else you can think of is not real in the classical sense. Consciousness is as close as we get to real. It may be the only real thing. Now, any philosophy that insists that consciousness does not exist, and we'll look at a few of them in future times, about how people talk about the hard problem of consciousness. Well, the hard problem of consciousness is hard precisely because we, in fact, are conscious. And they can't figure out how that can be in a material world. Well, you know, that's a problem for the material world theory, not a problem for consciousness. Because if there's one thing we do experience, it is our own consciousness. We know that's the case. Materialism is in fact dead and has been known to be dead by the better philosophers since about 1925. Nobody wanted to admit it, or a few. And that leaves basically solipsism and idealism and the latter virtually requiring some kind of cosmic consciousness to ground other consciousnesses. Now, I will close with a short quote from Richard Kahn Henry and Stephen R. Palmquist, apparently originally from the Journal of Scientific Exploration, and it's available online. And Dr. Henry has a fascinating story. He started out in a nominally Christian, but not uh, apparently Protestant, liberal Protestant, as far as I can tell, uh, uh, home which it did not function in his home. And, uh, you know, became an atheist, as many people do, uh, in that uh, background, and then was driven to a position of admitting there's a God, and he still doesn't like um, uh, um, he still does not like uh, intelligent design. Uh, his theory is that evolution is not true either, because that's a backloaded history. Just like if you do the Schrodinger's cat, when you open the door and find the cat dead, you'll be able to say, well, the cat died three hours ago, or whatever, by looking at the cat. And it was in superposition the whole time until you opened up the door. So a back history has been loaded up for you as well. And evolution is just a back history. But I will quote the, the paper now. Elaine Aspect is the physicist who performed the key experiment that established that if you want a real universe, it must be non-local. Einstein's spooky action at a distance. Basically, he did a, the PR experiment with modifications, and it doesn't fit. 
Aspect com comments on new work by his successor in conducting such experiments, Anton Zeilinger and his colleagues, who have now performed an experiment that suggests that giving up the concept of locality is not sufficient to be consistent with quantum mechanics unless certain intuitive features of realism are abandoned. Be clear what is going on here. Quantum mechanics itself is not crying out for such experiments. Quantum mechanics is doing just fine, thank you. Having performed flawlessly since inception. No, it is people whose cherished philosophical beliefs are being threatened that cry out for such experiments. Exactly as Einstein used to do and with exactly the same hope, we think in vain, that quantum mechanics can be refined to the point where it requires, or at least allows, belief in the independent reality of the natural world it describes. Quantum mechanics makes no mention of reality, figure one, and I'm gonna interrupt here to show you figure one. The location of one electron that is in a hydrogen atom, this is an electron uh, that is in the N equals 14 energy level and it has seven uh, units of angular momentum and you'll notice there are seven levels here and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 14 uh, uh, rows of humps and the quantity plotted is the probability that you will find the electron should you measure at that location. Note the many islands that are surrounded by zero probability. So somehow the electron is getting from one island to another without ever passing through the area in between. Or maybe passing through it at infinite speed. But somehow it's never found there. Quantum mechanics makes no mention of reality. Indeed, quantum me mechanics proclaims we have no need of that hypothesis, which of course is a, a comment on uh, Laplace and uh, when Napoleon asked him, well, where's God in your scheme? He says, well, we have no need of that hypothesis. So <laughs> now we are beginning to see that quantum mechanics might actually exclude any possibility of mind independent reality and already does exclude any reality that resembles our usual concept of such. As Aspect said, it implies renouncing the kind of realism I would have liked. Aspect was not trying to egg quantum mechanics on. Aspect was kind of hoping that the experiments would show a mind-independent reality. Non-local causality is a concept that has never played any role in physics other than in rejection, action at a distance. Well, of course, uh, Newton had that in gravitation. One of the things that, that Einstein did was to condense that gravitation into a field, but in the meantime, he had quantum mechanics. Um, until Aspect showed in 1981 that the alternative would be the abandonment of the cherished belief in mind-independent reality. Suddenly, spooky action at a distance became the lesser of two evils in the minds of the materialists. Why do people cling with such ferocity to belief in a mind-independent reality? It is surely because if there is no such reality, then ultimately, as far as we can know, mind alone exists. And if mind is not a product of real matter, but rather is the creator of the illusion of material reality, which is in fact, despite the materialist, been known to be the case since the discovery of quantum mechanics in 1925, then a theistic view of our existence becomes the only rational alternative to solipsism. If you believe that there are other minds out there, then you are stuck with the mind of God. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. Uh, just wait a minute. Sometimes it takes a little while I, to warm up. Uh, I was going to say I'll stick my foot in my mouth. Um, I'm thinking that for my 
non-scientific mind um, virtual reality or what were we calling it? Um, the kind that computer games do, right? Is not something I picture God is playing in. And yet, this man is saying that unless it's that way, or unless it is that way, then we don't need to believe in God. If it is that way, then there must be an intelligence behind it. And that just always is a lot of dissonance in my brain. Lots and lots of dissonance. Is, did I make sense? Uh, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, quantum mechanics creates dissonance in everybody's brain. We thought we knew what nature was all about. We found out we were wrong. We, of course, we don't have all the picture, so that could. Well, I mean, we still yes, have to wait but for we the whole have picture. enough of the picture to say that that naive realism is in fact naive. That we are required not to have what they call locality. That is to say, you cannot have atoms that simply bump around and pay no attention to the environment outside of what little environment they happen to see. You see, and, and you know, I made comments about how, how big brains these, these uh, particles have. They obey quantum mechanics and they, there's no mechanism for them to do so. I don't believe God deals in fakery and maybe this is not the same as fakery, but that's why it, it kind of smacks of phoniness to, to my mind. Well, I, one way of looking it, at it is not. supposing you're God and you wanted other intelligences to communicate with because you're, I don't know, lonely or whatever, okay? First of all, you create maybe or however God does that thing, split into two. Uh, you know, the, the double slit experiment may help us here. And, and so now you have two, maybe you have three, uh, because in addition to you and your beloved, you have, uh, uh, you want to maintain influence over the rest of the world. And that thing should be kind of on the quiet, okay? So the Holy Spirit doesn't stand up and, and be recognized most of the time, okay? <coughs> but, but then you want to create other intelligences. Well, you, then you want to communicate with them. You either have to communicate directly or you have to communicate through some kind of a medium. And so you create a medium what we're finding out is the medium does not have an objective reality behind it. A reality that is there whether you're looking at it or not. And so it's really, again, it's hard to defend against the idea that maybe this is in fact the most incredible uh, and that also allows God to go back where he hasn't filled in the details. I, I don't know if you've uh, ever played a, 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 a reality game like this, but um, my, my kids once had something called Pod Racer, and it was fun. You know, it was modeled after Anakin Skywalker, and, the, uh, and you zoom around this track, and you run into various uh, difficulties, and you're supposed to go around rocks and stuff, you know, and not crash into them. And, and, uh, and you've got to keep your pedal to the metal because <laughs> you, you want to win the race. Okay. Well, I, I saw it several times, so I know it, it happens routinely. But the first time I saw it, it was really odd. We came around, it came out of a tunnel where we were seeing everything. And we, and suddenly you look up and there's the sky, except that 
the, uh, the, uh, the terrain was not completely filled in. And so while you were driving, you could see the terrain start to be filling in. You know, well that's obviously a, a low budget uh, uh, simulation. But what that says is that all of the things that you see out there don't have to be real in order to look real. And maybe we are more important than many stars. And the God only has to fill in enough to where we get the, we get the picture. And because he's doing this in a more or less time independent way that he can fill it in uh, he can fill it in as much as he needs to to give us uh, the impression he wants and then he can go back later and put other things in and this is how God can take and answer your prayers before you before you ask them he gets started on the answer because he knows by this time that this is what you're going to do and so he goes back in time and he fills in the backstory. Well, I'm going to just hold my thinking on this because ultimately, who can know the mind of God? We have really no conception of how he views reality and his view of reality is reality. So that's right. That's we, where I'm going to rest my right. It, it, my the thing thoughts. of it is, we can complain about the computer games rules all we want to, but we're stuck in the game, so to speak. Paul. Yes, and then we'll come back over here. Uh, I'm sure there are all kinds of arguments against what I will suggest here, but uh, is it absolutely necessary that? these two worlds cannot coexist? Meaning a real world? Yes, as we're used to, and also uh, the quantum, uh, if you want to go say uh, the um, Copenhagen uh, escape. Uh-huh. Well, uh, yeah, if... I'm not sure that uh, uh, we have to exclude both of these, I mean, ex exclude uh, both of these realities. Well, if there was a nice line and we could say, well, electrons are quantum objects and photons are quantum objects, but once you get to atoms, we're a little more solid than that. You know, I could do that. But when you start sending buckyballs through two slits at the same time, that's getting uncomfortable for trying to make this into a quantum classical divide that's easily surmounted. Or that's that's that that's that's hard and fast. It looks to me like regular objects start acting like quantum objects as well. well maybe there's something that we don't know here. Well, <laughs> that's definitely the case. <laughs> okay, comment here and then we have one in the back. Well, we don't know all the reality and that is uh, look at uh, the uh, in the Old Testament where uh, uh, Isaiah was uh, praying and the angel took a ember off of the uh, incense uh, stand there in heaven and while he was still praying came to this earth and touched it on his tongue and look at Christ in the garden told Mary I've not uh, ascended to my heaven or to the Father yet do not touch me in the meantime he then faster than the speed of light traveled to talk with God, came back to this earth and walked with the uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus. 
within and, and no a several hour them. several hour period of time yeah. and we are restricted by the speed of light there's no way that uh, he could have done that under the speed of light so there is an ad additional dimension that we right now are not able to visualize or be, we we de we can detect it but we cannot work with it and we cannot uh, manipulate it but there's additional information and like Paul said right now we see through a, a, a glass darkly and uh, when we get to heaven we will then be able to see with much more clarity will our eyes will be opened we'll be able to see our angels and talk to our angels we're not able to see our angels now unless rarely when they're allowed to present themselves like uh, Elijah or Elisha talking to his servant opened up his eyes and the surrounding mm -hmm. hillsides were covered with these chariots of fire that uh, the uh, servant was not allowed to see until uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, Elisha or Elijah was you know, able to open his eyes to see those. So there, there's, there's an additional dimension that we're not able to you know, uh, partake of. And the most interesting one is the individual who was a pastor who was traveling from the east coast to the west coast in uh, Nicaragua or, or down there when he went, had to go to a new place. And I've had a chance to speak with this uh, pastor personally. They had to travel through uh, this enemy territory and without a convoy. Normally, you, t you take the convoy, but he had to be there for the next Sabbath, mm -hmm. so he couldn't take the convoy. They traveled through these areas, and there was places where they saw s strange individuals that it looked like you know, uh, hoodlums, so to speak. And they got to the next uh, town to get some gas, and one of these vehicles that they had seen at one of these little waypoints, they just let him pass. When they got to that place, one of these fellows who they had seen there, you know, came into town and was talking with the pastor and said, uh, where uh, did the armored cars go? And the pastor said, oh, I think they went on to base. And talking to him further, these uh, characters had seen this pastor's car come through, ta come through their valley with the very, very latest armored car ahead of him and behind him, completely outfitted with the flak jacks the, all the noise, the dust coming up, the wheels moving, the dust coming up off the road, the men you know, in their flak jackets and their machine guns and everything, guiding and protecting this little car. The pastor never saw anything at all, but the characters who were stopping people saw this as a virtual reality to them. It was real. Dust was coming off the ground, the noise, you know all the all the different things that yeah. you would see yeah. if it was a real thing to them it looked real just and the question is is just amazing was just the pastor amazing. blind or were these other people seeing hallucinations or but he was he was he was is, he was he was not blind because trick. he yeah. was not blind because he was driving his vehicle very carefully <laughs> down the road yes one of my favorite stories in the bible is the story of jesus and the two men on the way to emmaus at the end of the story, Jesus is sitting at the table with them and picks up the bread and starts to pray and suddenly disappears. Ellen White says that he walked with them all the way back to uh, wherever they were going. Or, or he ran, was just ran with them all the way back? Yeah, whatever yeah. they were doing. Um, last week, after you were talking about buckyballs, I decided I'd go home and read about buckyballs on the internet. Well, what came up was a company started by two young men making these tiny little ball bearing size magnets that were incredibly powerful, and small children were swallowing them. But they were so powerful that they would pull towards each other and go right through the walls of the intestines and the stomach to try to get to each other. And so anyway, they uh, had to stop the company. But I thought it was interesting. All I could find about buckyballs was those little buckyballs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, there's more than that around. And, I, and if you do buckyballs, quantum mechanics, you probably, or 
or double slit experiment, you should be able to pull up uh, some of this, some of the experiments yeah, I'm that sure have been done. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's interesting. We don't understand exactly how it works, and uh, it's nice to know. Sometimes it's not that important, you know. Uh, and we'd like to know where it came from and how it got there and what was the mechanism. What I can tell you is that the people who do the most of this and myself as a sort of a, you know, journeyman, amateur almost, um, uh, would have to agree with them that uh, we don't really understand how it works. There's an argument to be made that it doesn't work, uh, that that there is no mechanism, and that it's evidence that the entire universe is more mathematical than it is mechanical, and that Pythagoras was partly right when he said the world is number. Yeah. I sometimes hear people say, if all this stuff like before the flood and quantum mechanics were true, why didn't God write it in the Bible? I think one of the reasons God didn't put every single thing in the Bible and explain every single thing to us is that we would have thrown it out as if it was a book of kooks because we could not have understood what was going on. He gave us only what we needed to understand what it, the important stuff is. You know, Einstein, arguably one of the br most brilliant, if not the most brilliant person that's ever lived, um, uh, maybe Newton comes close, and there's a few people in India that makes you wonder. Um, but uh, uh, but Einstein fought against quantum mechanics tooth and nail till his dying day because it didn't make mechanical sense. And at first he said there were th hidden variables. Uh, Einstein Podolsky Rosen experiment was an attempt to say that no, there are hidden variables. There have to be. Turned out if you do it the right way, it proves that there aren't hidden variables. What it proves is that there's faster than light communication or else. And if you do it in a certain way, you can say the, the uh, photons don't even have a polarization. If they wait until the last femtosecond, do they get to wherever they're going to do? And then they decide right then and there, this is what I'm, uh, this is the polarization I want to have. And, and they communicate instantly to the other photon. Oh, and by the way, you need to have the same polarization. And that makes no sense with things as stupid as photons that have no brains, that have no, you know, there, there is no mechanical explanation. And maybe that's one of the things we were meant to eventually realize and those of us who were willing to accept that there is actually a cosmic consciousness that does run the whole show can swallow that. And those of us who really don't want that cosmic consciousness because we don't want anybody looking over our shoulder, um, can just kind of ignore the truth that's staring us in the face. In my mind, this does raise some element of morality. Even what is truth, can, it becomes rather vague at the moment. And then I'm reminded that there is an enemy who would confuse us. That's where I am at the moment. Now, this also makes it easier to swallow Jesus' statement, I am the truth. Because if Jesus is connected to God in a quantum mechanical way, if you like, he is God, he is not, he is man at the same time. When you figure that out, then you can, uh, then you can tell me how a particle goes through both slits at the same time. 
but uh, that that if Jesus is making the claim that he is somehow what created this entire thing in the first place, he is literally the truth. And if you think that you know the truth about automobile repair, you're going to find out that if you keep hanging on to what you know of the truth, you will eventually find Jesus at the other end. And that in order to avoid Jesus, you're going to have to cut yourself off from more and more and more of the truth until you have isolated yourself into a little ball. And even there, you're going to have to keep cutting off pieces. And maybe that's what happens to the wicked in the end is that they decide that they can't stand it. And if this is the way the universe is, they don't want any part of it. That has some interesting implications for love and the truth. Because what it says is that if, if you're not oriented towards love, if you're oriented towards self first, that there's no room for you in the universe. Because the universe, you're rejecting the mind that created it and that sustains it. It is literally true that it is not by its own power that breath follows breath and heartbeat follows heartbeat. It is literally true that it is only God's sustaining power. It isn't that we would all die, we would just simply cease to exist. So while I'm carrying this, is it then that we are little robots created by the only reality, which is God? <laughs> okay, I don't need to go there. And that we are robots with the ability to develop artificial intelligence. And if our thinking reaches a ho certain standard, God will say, hey, come and join me. Now we are fleshy, re self-reproducing robots but designed by the most incredible designer you've ever seen, using rules that we are just now getting a glimpse of. Disciples, many other things I had to tell you. There's things to tell, but uh, you cannot, you cannot handle yet. it now. They, 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 here is the one who created us, 37 trillion cells in our bodies. He knew exactly what was going on. I have to tell you many things, you really cannot handle it. And then Saint, I think it's uh, John chapter 21, he says he did many other things. This is John who probably was closest to the Lord mm -hmm. than anyone else. Mm -hmm. He says, I've seen it, but we just, the whole world cannot contain all the books that would have been written if you need what John saw was written down. Amazing. Yeah. And that's John with his understanding yes, of, of science. Understanding. Uh, a child that we know recently asked, well, what will we do in heaven after we've learned everything? <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it becomes obvious that it will take us eternity and we still won't know it all. I just wanted to share something from uh, education. This is uh, page 99. Upon all created things is seen the impress of deity. Nature testifies of God, the susceptible mind brought into contact with the miracle and mystery of the universe cannot but recognize the working of infinite power. Uh, this is interesting here. Not by its own inherent energy does the earth produce its bounties and year by year continue its motion around the sun. The unseen hand guides the planets in their circuit. 
A mysterious life pervades all nature. A life, <clears throat> excuse me, that sustains the unnumbered worlds throughout immensity and that lives in the insect atom which floats in the summer breeze, that wings the flight of the swallow and feeds the young rage ravens which cry. The same power that upholds nature is also working in man. The same great law that guides alike the star and the atom control human life. Um, I think it's just a glimpse into but we don't understand everything that we see in, in quantum mechanics, and there seems to be some thread that, we, that, that connects the quantum world with the world of life as we know it, including our spiritual life. So I thought that was interesting. Well, come back next week. We'll see what we can do to uh, bring the world of science and the world of faith together. <laughs>